So good evening, everybody. I'm Parisa Naruzi with Empower DC. Glad to have you all here for a meeting um, to discuss updates and action around equitable development and racial equity. Um, for those who may be a little newer to Empower DC, we are a, a grassroots membership-based organization um, coming up on our 20th anniversary, working with residents um, all throughout the city. And our work um, these days is, is largely focused in equitable development, which includes housing justice and making sure that communities have uh, decision-making powers when it comes to development in their neighborhoods, especially public properties, things like the Cromel School in Ivy City, as well as environmental justice and racial equity issues. And tonight, um, we're going to talk about issues that really are at the intersection of, of, of all of those buckets. Um, so I'm very happy to have a number of colleagues joining us tonight. Uh, first, we're going to talk about social housing with Will Merrifield. Um, who is an attorney. Uh, he has founded an organization dedicated to uplifting social housing as a model to uh, create the deeply affordable housing that we need. And he's going to uh, walk us through um, the legislation that the D.C. Council is considering, and there is a, a city council hearing on November 22nd. Some of you all may be interested in um, testifying or submitting comments, so we'll learn about that. Then we're gonna hear from our friends at 1DC about a zoning case that is pending pertaining to the Lincoln Westmoreland community in Shaw, which is a very historic community that was created out of the civil rights movement to ensure affordable housing for black residents in Shaw. And um, there's been a change in ownership. There's uh, efforts uh, afoot to, to uh, to uh, displace and, and build market rate housing. And so we're gonna hear the status of uh, 1DC's efforts organizing with tenants and um, upcoming zoning actions that we may be able to support. Um, we may hear a couple of other zoning updates from our friends at the Office of Attorney General Land Use Division, who we've been grateful to work closely with. And then we're going to, um, give an update about the implementation of racial equity analysis in zoning, which is one of the re newer requirements in the comprehensive plan that many of you um, uh, contributed to. Um, uh, Nate Bennett Fleming has been working with us and he will give a little update on what, uh, what we've been doing around that, what the zoning commission current status is, and then we'll just um, briefly touch on the city's release of the um, racial equity action plan that was released today and, and open for a comment period. So we have a lot to do. We won't have time to go through um, everybody's introductions, but feel free to put um, your uh, intro in the chat, share if you want uh, your ward or neighborhood or organization. And with that, if, um, if we're ready to go, I will invite Will Merrifield to uh, to take the floor. Thanks, Parisa. Um, thanks for having me tonight. I appreciate it. I wanted to, um, like Parisa said, my name's Will Merrifield. Um, I have been a uh, tenants attorney for the past decade in Washington, DC. And uh, my job was to represent tenant associations going through large scale redevelopments. Um, I became very interested in this concept of social housing based on my experience um, representing tenants through these redevelopment processes in Washington, D.C. And, and what I've seen. So what I'd like to do is just tonight talk a little bit about, um, give some context around uh, current D.C. policy, uh, talk about social housing as an alternative, and then um, talk about the hearing. Uh, that's happening on on uh, on the November twenty second. So, um, like I said, when I was an attorney, uh, you know, representing these tenant associations, what I saw was um, very clearly close up was the city giving away hundreds of millions of dollars of land and public resources to developers each year uh, to build luxury housing that wasn't affordable for most DC residents. Um, just some quick numbers around that. Between the years of 2003 and 2013, DC gave away uh, about $1.7 billion 
of taxpayer money and public land to developers. So during that same time period, from 2003 to 2013, that DC was giving away uh, this $1.7 billion. And that $1.7 billion, that number is probably low. That is what investigative reporters were able to uncover. And it's based on what DC was valuing the land at. DC, when they give away public land, oftentimes devalues the public land. So the giveaway to private developers doesn't look as egregious as what it actually is. So 2003 to 2013, $1.7 billion in land and money given away. Same time frame, DC lost half of its deeply affordable units. During that same time frame, high-end units in Washington, D.C. tripled. And during that decade of 2002 to 2013, 10,000 uh, Black residents in D.C. left Washington, D.C. So I would argue what those numbers show very clearly is that during this time frame, we were demolishing deeply affordable housing. We were demolishing whole communities. We were building in its place unaffordable housing, and it caused the displacement of working class uh, DC residents, mostly of color. Um, example, a, a great example of what I'm talking about in real life is the wharf. The wharf was uh, 97, or I'm sorry, the wharf was valued at 95 million. The, the land that the wharf is now built on was valued at $95 million. So the DC government gave away that land valued at $95 million to a developer for $1. That developer then parlayed that land giveaway into an $847 million loan from Goldman Sachs. And at the end of the day, we have the Wharf, which is selling penthouse condos. One of their penthouse condos, I think, is going for over $12 million. So in the midst of an affordable housing crisis, um, you know, that is the housing policy, an example of the housing policy that... Um, that Washington DC has employed. And that is why we've gotten to the place where we've gotten to, and I will say, in order to make way for the wharf and the Southwest waterfront, you know, we tore down a bunch of public housing that existed there and there's plans to tear down more public housing um, in the Southwest waterfront. So that's how we got to where we got to where we are today. And where we are today is fair market rent in Washington DC I'm sorry, not fair market, the average rent in Washington, D.C. for a two-bedroom apartment um, costs around $43,000 per year. Um, a minimum wage worker in D.C. makes about around thirty-one five. dollars So there's over a $10,000 gap between what a minimum wage worker makes in D.C. and what uh, average rent for a two-bedroom apartment is. So the only way that workers can live in D.C. is through some sort of subsidy. But uh, as Parisa knows very well, the uh, housing wait list has been closed since, I believe, 2013. There were 70,000 people on that wait list when it was closed. Um, and since they closed it, they scrubbed the wait list. And so I believe there's between 20 and 30,000 people on that wait list. So nobody is getting subsidies to live in Washington, D.C. unless they become homeless for the most part. Um, so that's the situation we're in. It's a desperate, terrible situation. I would argue that it's been caused by the housing policies, which I just outlined. What um, I'm advocating for, what, what is proposed um, is a new way forward and that's social housing. So there's a social housing bill. Um, I, was, uh, I, I worked with Janice Lewis George's office to co-author this bill. Um, the bill has, I believe, seven co-sponsors at this point. And what the bill does is it creates an office of social housing. And this is what social housing is. Social housing um, is a model in which government views housing as a public good and builds housing infrastructure that rationally and efficiently meets the needs of, of its citizens. So how does it do that? It builds housing that is mixed income. The bill that is put forward uh, by Janice Lewis George's office would uh, have a unit mix of two thirds of the units would be affordable for people making between 
zero to 50% of the area median income and a third of the units would be um, available for people making 50% of the area median income and above. So it's mixed income, it's open to all income levels. Um, everyone in a social housing, in, in, in the social housing model that Janice's bill puts forward pays 30% of their income in rent. Now this is the important part because social housing cuts out the private developer, there is no profit motive. So in a social housing model, 100% of people's rents are used productively. Every dollar you pay in rent is first reinvested back into the building. And those dollars cover the operating costs of the building. So they keep the building's maintenance up. After those costs have been paid, the surplus that's left over after the operating costs are covered for the building, that goes to pay down the construction cost of the building. So a social housing model is a way to build deeply affordable, mixed income housing that can pay for itself. Much more efficient than what we currently do, giving away a bunch of resources to developers to build luxury housing that people can't afford. This model that Janice's bill is uh, based on, that Councilmember Lewis George's bill is based on, um, it, it models the, the social housing model in Vienna, Austria. So in Vienna, uh, they have about 1.9 million people living in Vienna, Austria. They have 420,000 units of social housing in Vienna. 220,000 units of that social housing in Vienna is municipally owned, so it's owned by the Viennese government. And another 200,000 units of that social housing are co-ops or uh, nonprofit developers own it. What Vienna has done is it's created, and this is what this bill hopes to achieve, is the creation of a public option for people to choose social housing as an alternative to the private market if the private market's too expensive. So in Vienna, they've done that very effectively, and they have um, really great returns. I mean, the average rent, the average percent of income that people pay in rent in Vienna is um, 27%. And that includes both people living in social housing and people living in the private market in Vienna. So again, Vienna's created a public option that's driven down cost across the board for people. And um, just so you know, it's not only, you know, there's not only international models of social housing, they are beginning to build social housing in Montgomery County right now. The uh, Housing Opportunities Commission just built 236 units of mixed income, deeply affordable housing that's owned by the municipality. So it's a model that is proven internationally. It's coming to areas really close to the district. And I would argue it's just the way rental housing should be produced in the United States. And the only reason that it's not the way rental housing has been produced in the United States um, is because of the profit motive and the amount of money that uh, developers and investors make off, off real estate. Um, so that's sort of a rundown of housing policy, what social housing is. Like I said, I wanna give the, the specifics of um, the, uh, the hearing. The hearing is Tuesday, November 22nd at 11 a.m to sign up for the hearing. And I sent, um, I sent Parisa uh, the hearing notice, which has this information on it. So hopefully we can share that with the group. But uh, you, you email housing at dccouncil.us or you can telephone the committee. There's a telephone number that is in the hearing notice that we'll share with you guys. You have to sign up immediately because um, you have to sign up at least two business days in advance of the hearing. The hearing, like I said, is coming up next Tuesday. So if you want to testify, sign up tonight or sign up first thing tomorrow morning. You have to provide your telephone number, email address, organizational affiliation, or if you're just testifying on behalf of yourself, um, just say you're testifying on behalf of yourself. If you are an organization, you'll get five minutes to testify at the hearing. If you're not an organization, you'll get three minutes to testify at the hearing if you can't make it to the hearing. 
I know people have to work and they can't sit around on Zoom all day and wait for their name to be called to testify. So if that's not an option for you, you can still submit written um, documentation, uh, or I'm sorry, written testimony. Um, and the record for written testimony closes on December 1st. So you have up until December 1st to submit written testimony. You submit written testimony again by emailing housing at dccouncil.us, which will be on that hearing notice um, that Parisa can send around. Uh, I don't know, I, the Empower DC crew, uh, the people that show up for Parisa's meetings, you guys have probably testified. A lot of people have probably testified before in front of DC Council. Um, I always, my rule of thumb for testifying is uh, tell the council who you are, why you're testifying, state your support for what you're testifying for early, um, you know, in your testimony, tell the council why you support the bill and tell them why you think this piece of legislation is important to solving the affordable housing crisis if you do believe that it's important to solve the affordable housing crisis. So I want to end there um, because I think we have about six minutes left and happy to take questions, comments, or if there is none, cede the floor to Parisa. Thanks so much, Will. So if you have a question or comment, if you could put it in the chat or raise your hand if you can. Um, just wanted to mention that I did put the hearing notice and the testimony um, outline as well as a, a graphic that has some uh, talking points as well in the chat. If anybody um, is having a hard time accessing them, I can send them by email afterwards as well. Uh, I see Caroline and then Donald. Caroline? Yes, hi, thanks. Uh, and thanks uh, to Will Merrifield for that excellent overview of, of uh, social housing and, and uh, Janice Lewis George's bill. Um, my question has to do with uh, paying the initial costs of developing social housing in the district. And I'm wondering if the if you look if the housing production trust fund or or what else could be used to pay those initial costs so the bill um specifically uh talks about yes the housing production trust fund as a way to fund um social housing production as well as accessing federal money because uh social housing is is a way to green our housing infrastructure so using um, federal uh, money available to build new green housing. Um, I think that the mayor has proposed 450, I think the last budget was $450 million um, was put into the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, so yeah, we would advocate that Housing Production Trust Fund dollars be used. Also, the Montgomery County model is very interesting in the way they're able to leverage public money in the municipal bond market. Um, they leverage that public money about um, 37 to one. Uh, um, and they do that. It's, it's sort of a complicated mechanism, but they, they, they've created a $50 million revolving housing production fund by having uh, an allocation promised to them of $3.4 million by the county over a 20 year period. So $3.4 million each year for 20 years. They're able to leverage that in the municipal bond market into a $50 million revolving uh, housing production fund. So there are really efficient ways to do this. Um, and DC uh, has a lot of resources to do it. I mean, one of the things in DC, we have this huge budget and this horrible housing crisis and horrible inequality. So this is a way to use those resources to build uh, something good. Yeah, and just a quick follow-up on the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, would, would there need to be, to, to authorize this for this purpose, would there need to be changes made to the authorizing legislation for the Housing Production Trust Fund or the way it's written now, would, it, it, would that be sufficient? I believe the way it's written is sufficient. The bill also um, changes uh, public disposition of lands, um, and it, it, it makes that 
uh, a more strict process as well. So there's things written into the bill that uh, allow for these mechanisms to, to take place. Thank you. Donald and then Otis. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, two qu questions. I didn't quite follow what your definition of social housing. I'm just wondering if you could, or someone could put a, a link in the chat just where I can go to read more about exactly what is social housing, because obviously I must not understand business and money well enough. So I just want, you know, just helps me to read it. And the second thing is, I can't wrap my mind around why the district is giving away property to developers instead of selling it. So I know you don't represent the district, but what is their argument? Why would you give away land? And that's it for me. Thank you. I would argue the reason they give away land to developers is because developers control, developers and their investors control housing policy through a number of mechanisms. One is campaign contributions. And the other is that there is no proposed alternative of a better way to create rental housing. And, you know, a lot of public officials rely on developers to tell them what is the best way to do that. And what developers tell them is give us tax money, give us land and let us build, build, build. And eventually that housing will trickle down. And what we've seen is that it doesn't trickle down. Um, there was just a ProPublica article that uh, exposed, I mean, throughout the whole article, there's you know the, the company that created the technology saying this isn't price fixing, this isn't price fixing. But it talks about technology that uh, landlords and developers are using um, to get rents as high as they can possibly go. And one of the things that those technologies tell landlords and developers is to keep units empty at certain points to create an artificial demand that isn't there um, in real life. So um, I think that the reason we keep on giving away this stuff is because nobody is proposing an alternative. Social housing does propose this alternative in an easy way. I think um, I can send Parisa more articles that sort of talk about social housing and the mechanism of it that maybe she can share with the group. I'm sure it's not you, it's me. I probably didn't explain it clearly. But a really easy way to think about social housing is that it operates just like a co-op. Um, you know, in a co-op, a bunch of people live together and their rents go to the maintenance of the building first. And after the maintenance of the building, you know, it pays down whatever other costs are associated with the building. And that's, that's what social housing fundamentally does. I put the definition in the chat that's actually from the legislation. So you can take a look at that and then, um, you know, just to add to that comment about why would the city do this? I mean, to be clear, it's a policy choice, right? They've been decidedly pursuing gentrification. That has been the goal of the city. Stated very clearly, back by Anthony Williams, bring 100,000 new residents, right? Higher income residents. It has been the stated goal and, and city land has been used as a tool to promote that agenda. Um, Otis will be our last uh, question on this segment. Hey, Will, I thank you for all the work you've done in your career and, and for this presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, it, it seems like, you know, we, we've already built like so, so many um, market rate housing units in the city. And um, I think there's like a, a vacancy rate, like, like you were suggesting, but I'm wondering you know, it's like 10% or something or 11% or maybe it's maybe maybe it's even higher, but that was the number I, I last saw. I just was wondering, um, is there a way to do social housing without without the market rate units? Could you could you have social housing that that was purely like, you know, affordable across the spectrum of affordable housing and, you know, figure out how to pay for it, you know, through taxing what taxing the, the rich? Um, yeah, just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, what I think is the beauty of the models of social housing that work very well is that the broad, they're, they're broadly available, which really builds political will for the concept and allows us to envision an alternative way to build housing that sustains itself. The issue with, I think, you know, building housing 
recreating public housing is that it's easy to defund and it's hard to get broad political appeal for it. In Vienna, I think 80% uh, of the population qualifies for social housing. 60% of the population lives in social housing. And during the 1980s and during the 1990s, when public housing was privatized across Western Europe and in the United States, the Viennese social housing was never privatized and it survived because it was broadly available to a large sector of the population. And we see this with like Medicare and social security in the United States. I think those programs would have been cut a long time ago if they weren't broadly available. So I hear you and I, I completely understand where you're coming from as far as we have a housing crisis, we need to house people who need it now. But I think there is value to proposing a model that's self-sustainable and that has this broad appeal for the purposes of political will and to keep it from becoming what's happened tragically to the public housing system through disinvestment. You um, yeah I I um, want to say Otis that was one of my initial concerns you know being somebody that's um, committed to working to build the lowest income housing you know why would I want to be part of a program that is a third not that but I think you know the more that I looked into it and thought about it um, the the fact that it is two thirds deeply affordable housing is critical. I mean, that's what we need. We need a mechanism with when, it, with, with when to uh, build lots of units of deeply affordable housing and all of the existing models that, it, that we have as a city that we use do the opposite, right? We, we build maybe a couple with a massive number of market rate. Um, and as much as we're committed to public housing and, and trying to improve and, and fund and continue public housing, uh, the the fact that we don't have local control over it and that we have, you know, it has been um, subject to the, the federal, whatever's going on politically on the federal level and divestment as Will stated and uh, lack of support on the federal level, it just makes it very difficult um, to, to maintain without, you know, somehow fully taking over that system. So my hope with social housing is that um, we would incorporate into a new program uh, and a new um, system lessons learned from all of the other things that <laughs> all of the other programs that uh, we've done as a city and again um, you know still really focus on that uh, two-thirds of the units being affordable so I'd, I would encourage folks to consider testifying in support or just submitting um, something on the a written record I don't think that this bill will pass through the council before the end of the year and the end of the year is the end of the council period um, which means that um, it will, you know, be brought back up again in, in the new year. Uh, we don't know yet who the chair people will be for the housing committee, et cetera. Um, hopefully it has enough support to not be, you know, shelved, um, but certainly we'll have to work to, to make sure that doesn't happen. So thanks again, Will, um, for all of your work. And if you don't mind, you could put your, um, your contact information in the chat for people who may want to stay in touch with you. Yeah, and, and I'm... I'm Ahead, I'm Mark. also going to uh, drop some links into the chat that um, the articles about social housing so that, you know, if people are interested, they, they have access to those. So we're going to move now into uh, talking about Lincoln Westmoreland. I'm going I'm to have to hold on any questions right this minute because we're, we're a little over time. So we'll, hopefully we'll have a little more time for discussion after. But I want to make sure we get a chance to hear from 1DC. Rosemary, I believe, is our speaker. I don't know if um, Rosemary, anybody else was joining you. And um, and yes, we'll turn it over to you. Let me know if you need to share your screen. I'll, it, I'll, it's uh, really quick what I want to say. It's not discussion. I, I hear you, Karen, but I'm sorry. Right now, I'm not I'm not able to do that right this minute. Okay. So go ahead, Rosemary. Oh, um, thank you, Parisa. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to come to speak tonight. Um, I've already learned so much. Thank you, Will, for your presentation about social housing. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, what we've been doing with Lincoln Westmoreland II residents, all slash named, the building has been renamed Heritage at Shaw. Um, so back in 2014, and this goes to what Will had spoken to earlier, tw in 2014, um, Mid-City, who also owns Brooklyn Manor, 
um, went to Heritage at Shaw, which was that at that time, 121 units. Um, its name at the time was Lincoln Westmoreland II, and it's connected to what Parisa um, spoke about earlier. It emerged in the, 19, the late 1970s as a result of the urban renewal efforts that um, Walter Fontroy um, and other Black civil rights activists, including Martin Luther King, had lobbied the federal government and then also pressured the local housing officials to actually ensure that the urban renewal funds were actually used to, to house black people, particularly uh, low wage slash working class families, black families. And so Lincoln Westmoreland one and Lincoln Westmoreland two were part of a collaborative effort with actual um, local churches. And I think, um, since we have a representative from the Office of Attorney General, Lily can speak later um, or perhaps maybe share some of the talking time to talk more about the research, the great research she's done and her office has done about this. And so Martin Luther King, when he came to DC with, to support um, Walter Fontroy and the organizing that was going on in the 1960s, um, Lincoln Westmoreland one and two ended up being a product of that effort to make sure that black folks were actually housed in the city as opposed to constantly being displaced to make way for wealthier folks in the urban renewal um, period, which many of us may remember as the Negro removal era. And so in 2014, um, Lincoln Westmoreland 2, which is right on top of the Shaw Howard Metro stop, if you come out not on the Howard side, but on the R Street side, they're garden style apartments, they're right behind the high rise, that's Lincoln Westmoreland 1. And those, um, those apartments were actually Section 8, it was um, project based Section 8, HUD um, gave the land, or, uh, gave the land to ensure that it was developed for that. In 2014, Mid-City decided to opt out of the affordability contract. We were organizing already. We, One DC has been, been in Shaw since its inception, since 1998. And so we'd already had many relationships with tenants there. And we began to have conversations with the Tenant Association about how to address this issue, because we knew that that was the first domino that tends to fall in the pathway towards gentrification. And so we... Um, lobbied to meet with Mid-City officials at that time, who then had told us there were no plans for um, demolition or anything of the like, but we had pressured them to give us more information because we knew that, you know, what tends to happen is they tend to do constructive eviction, which is a fancy way of saying just decline maintenance and just wait till um, pre predominantly at that time, it was almost overwhelmingly Black families wait until they get tired and then they decide to move out. Because the affordability contract um, ended, federal law requires that residents get access to a voucher. Um, if you remain on the property, it's an enhanced voucher that can pay whatever the market rents that developers set, which is again to point to, to Will's point about how developers um, unfairly benefit from gentrification. Um, and so in 2014, tenants were demanding equal treatment because one of the things that was happening was as se several residents started to leave, the um, Mid-City came in and started to renovate the vacant units and turn them into market rate units by upgrading some appliances, but didn't want to do that for the residents that actually were living there. So we kept fighting. They insisted they did not have any legal requirements to actually upgrade all units. Um, Fast forward to twenty to COVID, twenty twenty two. Actually, this summer, we found out um, from I believe um, I think Office of Attorney General reached out to us and said uh, Lincoln Westmoreland two, which has been renamed as Heritage of Shaw after Mid City opted out of the Section Eight contract, um, has decided to tear down four of the buildings. So there's two. Um, Lincoln Westmoreland 2 slash Heritage of Shaw spans about three blocks or two and a half blocks. And so one on one particular block housed about uh, 50 families. And they had decided to tear it down to make way for a market rate development. We were, you know, completely shocked. We knew that this was what they were doing, but they took COVID as their perfect time to initiate some of their plans. So 
we quickly got involved with some of the tenants. Again, the tenants said, this is ridiculous. We knew that this was happening, but we wanna make sure we actually, make sure Mid-City actually lives up to the idea of equitable developments in this, since the city claims that it's supposedly invested in that. And so we went to the zoning commission um, lobbied for party status and won. So we now have party status. So we were able to, at the zoning commission, um, ask some critical questions about what Mid-City's plans were. We, in that um, meeting, we learned that Mid-City planned to, in its stead, build up to, I want to say, 130 something units that are majority market rate. 48 of them would be quote unquote affordable. Um, and they said that that affordable housing would be produced or provided through the inclusionary zoning. Inclusionary zoning is one of the many um, tactics that since um, the city has invested in gentrification as a strategy, um, has decided to implement as part of the quote unquote smart growth movement. And essentially what that meant was that essentially when, when Mid-City introduced that, they said, oh, well, this is our way of actually ensuring we're building more affordable housing because not only did the displaced residents get vouchers, but now we have more. Um, and, and so we learned that that was a ridiculous position to be taking and for the very simple reason that you actually have to apply for the lottery. Um, it's essentially, the IZ program is a lottery essentially. And so tenants who were displaced would have to apply for the potential chance to get back in. And so what we've been doing is uh, we met with Mid-City shortly after um, to remind them that that's not actually uh, a right to return. That is the right to play the lottery and the chance to play the lottery. And so we argue that it's important that there is the additional set aside. We're at the current stage now where we're gonna go back to all the tenants because many of the tenants have been sprinkled throughout the Shaw community. There's still a huge concentration of them within the Shaw community. And so we're going to be doing um, outreach again this Saturday at 1 p.m. And we're gonna be outreaching to at least four of the buildings that are in Shaw where we know that there are uh, displaced tenants there to do two things. One, to get um, residents to consider signing a petition uh, that says that these set aside units should be a part of any zoning um, approved development related to that, those 50 or so units. That that set aside should first go priority to the 50 families that were displaced and were not notified that this was actually Mid-City's plans. And then the second priority are families that were displaced, period, from Heritage at Shaw so that they don't, um, again, try to justify, well, 50 of the families all didn't take these set aside, so then we can now get them, go back to inclusionary zoning or not even make them affordable at all. And then the last, the last um, point on the petition will uh, stipulate that Mid-City needs to link its zoning um, plans also to the continued maintenance, because there's still 70 or so units at Heritage of Shaw, and that they have been, residents have been complaining for quite some time that the, quite the maintenance has declined dramatically and so that they see the writing on the wall. And so they want absolute assurance and legal and, and a legal document that guarantees that they will be notified and included in any future development plans that are related to the remaining heritage at Shaw. So we're doing that petition. And in addition, we're going to have an additional petition for the residents who actually were displaced and they will be uh, have their name signed saying that they are actually very interested in making sure they have that set aside. And so that they, because um, Mid-City is arguing that we um, don't have as many people so they don't have to pay us much mind. Um, and so having that written um, test, that written petition, two of those different written petitions, one shows our political strength in the neighborhood in terms of tenants' desires for what should happen to that property. And then two, it shows that the Mid-City actually has to do um, out offer some material redress by offering a concrete form of right to return. So I'm gonna pass it back to Parisa. Oh, and I forgot one last thing. So in addition to doing the um, outreach this Saturday, tomorrow is actually, we're gonna be submitting written testimony as a follow-up to the zoning hearing we had on October 20th. 
And then December 15th, the zoning commission is coming back again. And we're invited to come back to that so that they can then decide what they're going to do. And so at that point, we would have the tenants, the petitions, as well as the additional documents um, that we've submitted. So I think that's it. And I'm going to um, open it up for a few minutes of uh, comments or questions. I'm sure if folks are interested in providing support, helping with outreach, um, getting, you know, helping to turn out to these, uh, to the, um, to the zoning hearing on the, on December 15th, et cetera, I'm sure um, Rosemary and others would, uh, from 1DC would, would be happy to have the support. Rosemary, would you mind putting your contact information in the chat? Um, and do we have any comments or questions? Feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. I just encourage everybody to, you know, Google and look into the history a little bit. It's very profound. Um, Lily, did you want to add anything from the OAG's office on this one? Um, no, I think Rosemary summed it up really well. I would just say that there's the planned redevelopment has 317 units, so it's it's going to be pretty large. And they're um, right now they're proffering 15% uh, of IZ units, um, and most of the units um, affordable and market rate are studios and one bedrooms. And so it doesn't replace the mostly two and three bedrooms that currently exist for families. Um, I could add more a little bit more about like the the December 15th hearing is. It's not a hearing; it's a it's a meeting, so there won't be opportunity for the public to comment. But um, I'm sure um, if you reach out to Rosemary, there there might be a way to to have your voice heard. Yeah, and I put in the chat the um, link to the zoning record. So if you want to go in and see the plans, yes, it is a, a plan to tear down and and build, um, you know, higher density, bigger uh, bigger buildings. Um, I was just gonna, you know, encourage everybody to look into the history. I mean, the the the, the fact that this uh, housing was developed out of struggle. You know, people were fighting to make sure that Black people were not displaced from the city. In response to what they saw happen in Southwest, as Rosemary was talking about. So the fact that you know Walter Fontroy and um, the I think the organization was called the Model Inner City uh, Organization and um, the fact that Dr. King came and, and marched with them and commended them on, on what they were doing um, shortly before his assassination. And the fact that now, all these years later, you know, the city would allow something like that to just be um, wiped away and replaced with something that does not, of course, maintain that same uh, purpose and vision. Um, so uh, there's a couple questions in the chat, Rosemary. Um, Nick is asking, is the building in a in an historic district? That's a great question. Actually, Parisa recommended we reach um, out to Sarah. Um, remind me her last name, Sarah. Yeah, Schoenfeld. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, we, we did discuss um, whether, because this property certainly has historic importance, whether it would be, um, you know, in their interest to consider that. There is not a historic district there, to, to my knowledge. Um, and then the other question from Martha Davis, does IZ not consider that unit sizes must accommodate families? Um, I can take that one. Um, it, so I, the IZ requirements are that it has to be proportional to what the uh, whole building is providing. So if the whole building is providing just 100% one bedroom units, then IZ has to provide um, one bedroom units in the same proportion. So because most of these new units going up are smaller units, IZ will also be smaller units. And to the question uh, Mitchell put in here about um, why does why is the property not subject to TOPA? That's a great question. Um, Sorry, so why don't I, let me clarify for people. TOPA is Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So like the opportunity for the tenants to purchase. Sorry for the acronym. <laughs> So how do we want to tag team it? Lily, did you want to answer or did you? Um, I'm not a TOPA expert. Um, what uh, TOPA does require is that tenants that are currently living in the building, um, if it's being sold, have the opportunity to purchase. And uh, the owners in this case moved all of, displaced all the tenants before yeah. it was sold. Um, 
which is a pretty common tactic. I will also say I um, don't believe that uh, DOPA, which is the District Opportunity to Purchase Act, I, there's still um, requirements that a um, landlord who's selling a building file something saying that it is being sold, and I'm not sure if they did that in this case, um, but I, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes here. There, this is clearly a bad actor, right? This is Mid-City, the same developer um, that, as Rosemary mentioned, at um, Brooklyn Manor, using a lot of similar tactics in terms of taking away things that tenants would have normally enjoyed um, and uh, making, you know, moving people out ahead of filing for development as a means of, you know, removing people uh, so that they don't have to deal with the questions about returning and relocation and all of that. Um, so um, we certainly stand in full support, Rosemary, of you and 1DC and the tenants, and um, um, welcome, you know, ongoing updates to see how we can how we can help. Appreciate y'all. Can I ask if anyone wants to join us for the outreach day? We would appreciate it. We have 1DC members, but we always love to have Empower DC members join us. So feel free. I put my name in the name in the chat. I'll put it again. Um, and I think Haley may be on the call. Haley, if you are on the call, if you want to drop your name in the chat too, so we can reach out to either Haley or myself, and then we'll get y'all on the team. We appreciate y'all. Thanks so much. Okay, so I want to now turn to uh, OAG. Um, is Alex or Lily, whoever wants to take it over? Yeah, I think Alex is a little under the weather, but I don't know if you want to. Sorry, Alex. Do you want me to go? Um, sure. I will. As Lily said, I'm a little under the weather, so Lily may be jumping in if I start rambling on too much. Um, but just to sort of give everyone an update as to what OEG has been working on, um, our focus this fall has been um, mainly on several PUD cases, so planned unit development cases that have been coming before the commission. Um, with our focus being on the applicants' affordable housing proffers. So, as part of a PUD, applicants are required to proffer public benefits. Um, the key one is affordable housing. Um, that's not just our opinion, that is um, also codified in the comprehensive plan, which designates affordable housing as a high priority PUD benefit. Um, so we've been intervening in these cases, advocating for a higher set aside of affordable housing. And what we've used to determine that set aside is the existing IZ plus program. So that's the inclusionary plus program, which currently applies to map amendments. Um, we are making the argument that it should also apply to PUDs because it's sort of an analogous situation where the applicant is gaining additional density um, that allows them to build bigger buildings and therefore there should be an equivalent um, higher IZ set aside. Um, so I'll talk briefly about the two cases that I've been on, and then Lily can jump in, um, follow up on 2209, which is the, um, sorry, the one we just went through. Um, so the two that I've been working on are in Southwest. They're about a block away from one another. Um, so the commission heard the first one, the case number for that is 2206, um, back in the beginning of October. And that was the first time that we had sort of presented this argument to them. Um, it was not initially particularly well received. Um, there was pushback from both the commission and the applicant on it. Um, we then had the second hearing this past Monday. Um, the case number for that is 2211. Um, and we were actually really pleasantly surprised that that did seem to go over better this time. The commission seemed more receptive to the argument, they seemed interested in, you know, getting the applicant to respond to us and provide their numbers, sort of justifying what they were proffering in response to us. Um, you know, getting more information on the record is really a key thing, we think. Um, and then also express some interest in potentially having this come forward as a text amendment, uh, memorializing it formally as a way to have an increased proffer for PUDs. Um, so, both cases, the ANC was in support of our position. Um, Southwest Action testified this past Monday in support, um, you know, also bringing up the issues of displacement that have happened in Southwest with all of the redevelopment down there. Um, so it's been, I think we're slow, hopefully slowly gaining ground. So that has been those two. I'll let Lily talk about hers as well. Yeah, so in the final pod, the Lincoln Westmoreland that you just heard about, um, 
we made a similar argument that IZ had to be the minimum required. Um, in this case, it was a little bit different because there is language in the comprehensive plan that specifically addresses Section 8 housing that hasn't been renewed um, and that um, as a result should require anti-displacement measures to be in, uh, enforced and then also one-for-one -one replacement of the affordable housing at the same affordability level. So we pushed for that. Um, the commission uh, will, you heard from Rosemary, um, was uh, not, they didn't latch on, but they did ask questions. And so we'll see what they, what they say at the next um, hearing. I also just wanna thank Rosemary and all the tenants um, that testified because um, these, I don't think in these zoning commission hearings that uh, the commission often hears from the tenants that are actually impacted by these cases. And so it was really powerful um, for them to hear directly from the tenants. Um, and so thank you, Rosemary, for all your work. Um, there's one final pod that we are addressing. Um, it's in Friendship Heights. Um, it's actually a pod that was first granted approval in 1996 and is now seeking a modification, although they're tearing down the building and rebuilding it, they're keeping the foundation. So technically it's just a modification. Um, they are also proffering 15% IZ. Um, but it's designated in the comp plan as being within a specific area um, that requires a higher higher level of planning analysis um, around utilities and um, infrastructure. Um, and if that planning analysis doesn't happen, then zoning changes are supposed to wait. And if zoning changes take place before the planning analysis, then it should be required to provide 33% inclusionary zoning. Um, so we'll see how the commission feels about that argument. Um, but that's the, the, if anyone, that um, hearing is on December 5th, it's a public hearing. So I can send around information on how to testify um, as well as uh, what we will be filing in that case. Um, I wanted to ask if you could just for, for the benefit of people who may not have heard you speak before, just go back and recap what the land use division uh, is focused on at the Office of Attorney General and, and how residents like those on this call, ANC commissioners and others can, can um, reach out to you, what type of support they can get from you all. Yeah, sure. So um, as of last October, um, OAG is no longer advising the Zoning Commission and the Board of Zoning Adjustment. That is now all housed within the Office of Zoning. Um, so that freed us up to take on this new public interest role. Um, so advocating for the public interest, which we've sort of broken down into four main areas. So affordable housing, racial equity, um, environmental justice and sustainability, and what we've termed procedural equity. So that's trying to level the playing field, making sure that everyone is able to participate fully, that residents understand what their rights are in the process and are able to exercise them. Um, and we're doing that in sort of implementing that through what we've referred to as the three-legged stool. So part of that is intervening in cases. So like these PUD cases this fall, um, we've also proposed text amendments, uh, mainly focused on affordable housing, but also trying to address some of the procedural issues. Um, so one of the ones that we've introduced actually goes to a lot of the issues with tenants and tenants' rights and displacement that came up in at least case 2209, the Lincoln Westmoreland case. Um, and then finally providing just sort of support um, and training and education for the general public residents, A and C's to sort of increase zoning literacy. So again, trying to under explain the regulations, explain how everything works, because it is a very weird little world where things don't always mean what they mean in the normal world. Um, so trying to make that more easily understandable for people. Um, so anyone who's on the call tonight, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll put our information in the chat. Um, if you have questions about any particular issues, zoning in general, um, you know, any particular projects that are coming up, um, we're always happy to talk and see, you know, how we can help. And just, it's also helpful for us to understand sort of what issues are out there, what people are concerned about. So Lily, I don't know if you have anything else that you want to throw in there. Uh, nope, our contact info is in the chat and we'd love to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, and just to respond to the one question in the chat. So what we're focusing on again is affordable housing, um, racial equity, environmental justice and sustainability and procedural equity. So I wanna open it up for any questions for um, Alex and Lily about um, the zoning cases that they just uh, spoke about or the work of their office, anything, and people can um, raise their hand or go in the chat. 
question? Caroline. Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I guess I, I was wondering, um, maybe it's too early, but there's going to be a transition in, at the top in your office. Um, what changes, if any, do you expect from that? Or maybe it's too early to know. Um, I think it's a little early to know. I mean, there is going to be a change in the administration come January, but we think that the issues that we're advocating for are going to sort of survive any change in leadership. I mean, affordable housing is going to continue to be a major issue in the city as is racial equity. Um, so I think we're sort of cautiously optimistic that not much should change. Um, obviously, each AG, AG is going to come in with their own particular focus, but we think these are sort of I guess, universal themes um, that will continue. Sure, it doesn't hurt for us to put in a good word for the continuation and growth of the land use division. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure we figure out how to do that. Um, we appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any other uh, questions for Alex and Lily? I have a question, um, Alex. You said that you all are um, doing the environmental justice piece now um, with the new, um, with McDuffie coming in, are you all gonna pick up on the, the environmental justice task force? I think going into 2023, we're trying to expand more into that area. We haven't done a ton with it this past year, being it's our first year, we sort of kept our main focus on affordable housing, but I think we will um, in the new year be exploring different ways to branch out more into that area. So any suggestions that anybody has or any issues, um, we would welcome to hear from them. I have one that intersects uh, zoning and um, environmental justice. So we'll be, we'll be reaching out to you about that. Great. Okay, so we have um, Nate Fleming is joining here in a minute. And um, as we wait for him to get on, I will just talk briefly about um, today, earlier this morning, the uh, mayor's office on racial equity released the city's first racial equity action plan. Um, it's a two year plan. And I'm going to put the link in the chat. I haven't had a chance since it was just released today to really delve into it. Um, but there is a comment period. It's a draft plan. And the comment period is now through January 2nd. So we will be um, looking at whether you know we want to hold uh, a working session to go over it and, and develop comments collectively. Um, it would, I would be really interested to hear from you all if you think it's worthwhile to, to do that. Um, the event this morning, some of you all were there. Um, it was a packed room. Uh, there was you know a panel of, of speakers. Lots of good stuff, of course, being said. <laughs> but I think uh, somebody was... Um, Somebody somewhere I, I was saying was questioning, you know, why why the mayor focusing on racial equity now in her third term when her first two terms were uh, exacerbating racial inequity. Um, but well, you know, yeah, we'll see. maybe she's got, received the criticism and re realizes she has to do something about it, or or maybe it's window dressing. Who knows? But we're gonna um, you know use what we can use in terms of momentum to push for for real change. So. Please take a look at the link um, and again, you know, consider submitting comments uh, by January 2nd and look out for, um, we'll probably hold a some type of session just to, to go over it together, talk through it, maybe come up with some um, collective uh, comments around it. And we, you know, I think for me, like I hesitate to do comments that are just put into a void. <laughs> So what I would prefer to do is, yeah, we can put comments, but do something more visible in public, like say, put out a public statement about what we appreciate the plan or where the plan falls short, you know, so that we kind of are using it to really bolster um, the advocacy and not just kind of submitting an email or something that nobody ever sees. Uh, any comments? Did anybody get a chance to look at the plan and wants to provide um, any any reflections? I know what uh, Reverend Thompson was there this morning, Fred Jackson, Will Jordan, uh, Sabrina. Any comments on the racial equity action plan? Uh, this is Reverend Thompson. I guess I'm still just going through it and, and trying to make sense of it. And uh, we'll be kind of going line by line to figure out comments because I really felt like given all the emphasis that they made 
uh, about comments, I, even though you know there might be a public statement, I wanna be sure that I've got comments going in, so. No, that's great. Um, Reverend Thompson is um, really keen, like she's on, on top of things when she's looking at something, she, she looks at details and I really appreciate that about her, so. I'm sure um, she'll have some great comments. I'd, I'd love to see them and see how we can echo some of what she comes up with. Um, any other comments, uh, Fred? I saw you uh, I saw you there this morning. Yes, uh, I thought it was a good presentation, but as you indicated, we, we do really well with presentations and conversations about what might be exciting, but it's always about measuring some results. So um, I thought the folks who are on the panel did a really good job, especially Tony Lewis. I th thought hit it right on the button, which is our wealthy developers aren't doing enough to ensure that our population are getting the investment that we need for training and education, uh, as well as to make sure that our returning citizens have opportunities to work and be employed and get the skills that they need. So as you indicated, I definitely are gonna participate in making some comments about it. Um, I just think that right now we are in such a great position to do so much for our moderate income, low income people. Uh, there's a lot of money coming into our HBCUs. There's opportunity for research and, and, and money going into Howard University, uh, UDC. Um, so I, I believe that we just need to continue doing what we're doing, but we have to move at a faster pace. We're not moving fast enough, right? So that's the comments that I have is that we have to move faster because we're behind. <laughs> quite frankly, right? We all know we're behind, but that means you have to pick up the pace, accelerate good things that you're doing. And that's the opportunity that's here. And I think we're gonna take advantage of it. So I'm optimistic about that. William? Yeah, this is William Jordan. Um, a lot of the actual report is DC government employee training, HR issues and training training employees to be more racially equitably sensitive. So in glancing through, there's almost nothing in there where you see DEMPED or DCB or um, Department of Environment or any entity like that. It's basically a, a HR internal, do the minimum kind of thing. There's nothing concrete in that at first glance looking through it. So don't expect much. Yeah, unfortunately that tends to be the case. And yes, in the um off the mayor's office on racial equity, the bulk of what they've done so far has been training for for agency staff. It's unclear at this point uh how the city is really going to have capacity to really do the racial equity work just by having some internal trainings for staff and not I think we do you know if we we do need to have goals set tangible goals to your point William not you know real goals in um you know uh the the real programs so that we can measure uh what the city's progress is and so that is a, a little bit of a segue to um, give an update on the uh, racial equity analysis work that's taking place within zoning. I think many of you, um, you know, of course, were part of the effort around the comprehensive plan to get that language incorporated. And then many of you participated or, or watched the round table that the zoning commission held in September. So we've been just trying to stay on top of that, um, push that work forward. And I'm gonna turn it over to Nate Fleming to give a little update on that. Thank you, Parisa. Um, so as Parisa stated, we've been tracking and collaborating um, in the building of the uh, racial equity tool um, at the Office of Zoning. And they've reported back to us the um, last official action was a round table last week where um, the zoning commissioners each gave it an update responding to the um the previous hearing and I, and I'll go over that um but before that roundtable 
there was a meeting that with the Office of Zoning's lawyers and Empower where they briefed us on some of the changes that they've made to the racial equity tool. Um, in general, we, we, we believe that some of the changes that they've made are in, in the right direction. It makes the tool um, more detailed. It, it, it requires more from applicants. And the bulk of the changes really have to do with um, expanding the community engagement section. And um, our thinking is that that's the area that if community engagement is done right, um, is foundational to, to every other outcome that we would like to see um, from these, this process. So there were the, the community engagement prompt of the racial equity tool was improved and they created um, new categories, new assessment categories. And I'll try to summarize them, them briefly here. Um, the new assessment categories include um, a section called community. And this section allows the movement to define the community that's affected um, using categories such as A and C, the planning area, the ward or, or district wide. And the questions that are asked in the community section is, what community is affected by the zoning action? What specific factors define the affected community? And who would potentially be burdened as a result of the zoning action? The next section um, seeks to discuss past discrimination and harm to the community. So this prompt is designed to, to yield a community narrative um, that can speak to past zoning actions that have harmed that particular community. The next section is um, a prompt as it relates to community data that's disaggregated by race. And some of the questions that are asked by that prompt include the following. What data about existing demographics of the community is relevant to the proposed zoning action? When the relevant data is disaggregated by race and ethnicity, what does it show? Um, and three, what do available data sources about the intersectionality of factors such as race, ethnicity, age, income, gender, or sexual orientation within the community, and how might the zoning action impact the intersections of those factors? And they use various um, different demographic categories to, to bear that out and, and bring that out. The next section speaks to community participation outreach efforts. So this section is a series of questions that are designed to describe the community engagement process and any changes that are made to the plan or the proposal as a result of any community engagement. And, and one weakness of this section um, was the lack of documentation or evidence that's required to evidence the quality or the, the results of any community engagement sessions. So that's one area that we really wanna focus on improving. Um, and then the following and, and closing sections are really follow-ups to seek to um, articulate or, or bear out any, any community priorities that come out of the community engagement and any changes and outcomes that have resulted from the community engagement process. So we believe that the focus um, on a more detailed, a more substantive racial equity tool that specifies and, and seeks to, um, to promote changes in the plan um, that are bared out by um, community engagement is a positive um, development. And in the last meeting, um, the round table at zoning, um, some of the main takeaways were the fact that um, Commissioner Hood, the, the chairman of the commission, he really spoke about, you know, the need to ensure that, you know, the tool has teeth, that it actually results in, in, in a change in, in outcomes. And they made a commitment to respond to um, the testimony and the case record that many of you participated in in the um, October roundtable, they plan to respond to that by um, mid-December. And it seems that there is um, a lot of consensus on the um, Zoning Commission about the need for a, a stronger tool, a need for a tool with teeth, 
There was um, a lot of um, concurrence from other commissioners, particularly Peter May and Joe Imamira. The um, dissent, if there is any dissent ideologically on the commission, seems to be um, with, with Rob Miller. And, and his concern, you know, it, is largely uh, developer-driven, um, particularly he's concerned with putting too much of a burden on the applicant. He's concerned um, that the Office of Planning has um, the capacity in his mind, has the data, has the tools to help do this work. And he, he doesn't, in his mind, want the applicant to be doing the work of, of the Zoning Commission, which puts forward the question that I think we need some feedback uh, from you guys on. Uh, and, and that is, there seems to be um, some desire from stakeholders to create a, a new entity to do some of the um, racial equity analysis, whether that's a, a racial equity officer at the Zoning Commission, or whether that's the, the Office of Planning, or whether that's a, a new body or commission that's created for that factor. So I wanted to, in terms of questions um, for the group to get feedback on, I'm very much interested in your thoughts on, on, on where that body would be um, most well-placed, whether that's in, um, in your experiences at, at the Office of Planning, whether they have the capacity, um, whether they're well-suited to, to play this role, whether they're uh, a model similar to the Council's Office on Racial Equity could be stood up um, within the Zoning Commission, um, they're, them having a Chief Racial Equity Officer embedded in a, a, a Racial Equity Office embedded within the Commission, or a third model where a, a new commission is created um, in order to um, provide the racial equity analysis. And then finally, on the question of two questions as it relates to community engagement with the, um, the proposed, the new proposed tool is um, we, we're, we're interested in your perspectives on how to best evidence the community engagement that takes place. Currently, the community engagement sections of the racial equity tool do not require um, any, you know, meeting minutes or, or anything that really um, will back up the claims of the applicant as it relates to the quality and the quantity of the community engagement that's done on the project. Um, and, and that's really, um, I guess, um, the heart of, what, of my update and, and the areas that I'm really um, interested um, in hearing feedback on. Um, so, Parisa, that's 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 it for me. Thanks, Nate. And I'm going to open it here in a second for um, for discussion. So, just to be clear, what Nate was reporting on um, the 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 additions to the racial equity tool have not been released publicly. What we were privy to was a presentation by the staff of a draft. At the point that they gave us the presentation, they would not give us any documentation of it and we couldn't share it. Um, so we're just trying to summarize sort of what we heard. I think the biggest um, you know, positive thing coming out, the biggest changes coming from our uh, where we were with the initial racial equity tool is that they are adding this whole community engagement section, which was absent from the initial tool. So that's what Nate was describing. Um, and then uh, there also seemed to be some acceptance of the idea that displacement effect is not just people on site. And so I think that they're they're starting to uh, move towards that um, broadening again, although uh, still we have not seen a, the new, you know, a new draft that is being made public, publicly available. So nothing is set in stone at this point. Um, but as Nate said, I mean, the more and more we think about this, the racial equity analysis itself is not going to deliver the results that we want because the, they can still approve projects whether or not they're racially inequitable. It just helps to highlight the issues, right? And so for us, the community engagement part probably is the biggest game changer because we know that once people are in the room, the whole conversation changes, right? And that's what we know. And that's our job as organizers is to make sure that the most impacted people and the people who are typically being excluded from these conversations are in the room. So if we can have them, you know, force the engagement to be done in a certain way, we think that it changes the trajectory of everything else. Um, so just to reiterate the second question they posed is um, 
what is the what what should be required in terms of evidence of that validates community engagement was has taken place in, in the past you know the city is really good at this fake window dressing engagement right um so they may have meetings they may have dozens of meetings and they may show a sign in sheet but that doesn't show in any meaningful way what was said and how what was said changed the decisions so wanted to throw it open and see if you all had a, a, any gut reactions to what could be required to evidence and validate community engagement. Sabrina and then Lily. I was just thinking about that. And I think there should be a community representative on a board in all of these agencies so that um, we can make sure that, there, that that's the community engagement. Whoever's on the board can come back to the community. But them just saying that they're doing community engagement and writing things in their records is not enough. They need to have someone from the community that to represent the community at each agency. Okay, thank you for that. That um, reminds me of an ombudsman position, like a, somebody within the agency to watchdog the agency and make sure that they're doing the right thing. So yeah, interesting. Nick and then uh, William. Some experience on an ANC, they do have what's called great weight and sometimes it's scoffed at, but here's the deal. <clears throat> Great weight means that whatever is heard must be responded to. So uh, that at least is evidence that they read what you said and they are saying, no, we're not doing that. We don't like it uh, because, or we are going to accept it and this is the change we're making. So I think that if that is uh, effectively used, it can be um, powerful. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. I like that idea. William? Yeah, I think. <clears throat> Somehow community engagement has to be tied to standing in the particular case. So otherwise it almost has no meaning. So rather than worrying about whether they hit the points, you wanna have the ability to challenge, cross-examine, present evidence. And that is, through that mechanism is how you would evaluate um, community engagement, whether the community can engage. So I don't know if it's, if you can show that the group who's, who's the excluded group is not there, then there's a process that gets them standing in the case. And then maybe you have to hit certain check marks to do that. Um, because my experience, of course, is, uh, you know, depending on who, who your A and C is, they will rubber stamp. So if your A and C rubber stamps, then you're silenced unless you have standing. And of course, there's a lot of that going on, and it's easy to make that happen. Thank you, William. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's almost like why would they allow a, a case to move forward if the affected people are not even there? Right. So clearly, and that which is the case a lot of times, right, because the affected people don't know about it, or they there was no outreach, there was no capacity, you know, to engage. So it kind of that that your comment reminds me of that. Uh, Max, good to see you. Hi, and I, I apologize that for some reason that I'm, I'm appearing also as Lily, uh, for, Lily for those of you who who haven't seen me, I, I work with Lily uh, with OAG's equitable land use uh, section. Um, and I just wanted to just add a, one comment, which was that in terms of the community engagement, I think that is important, what ha vital, what happens outside of the hearing before the commission, but also to make it clear that I think one of the aspects that should happen here is there should be data and the applicant as well as the office of planning should be prompted to provide an analysis, but that analysis should then be subject to what to challenge, to amendment, 
to expansion by the public in any particular case. So if the applicant says this is only going to have a positive racial equity impact, that folks who live in the neighborhoods can say, well, actually, that's based on suppositions information that is incomplete. Here is this other. And so I think I just want to make it clear that I think it's it's both sort of before and outside of each individual case, as well as also in the in within the context of the case, because it's important, as Leda mentioned earlier, it was wonderful to hear from one DC and the folks that they were able to get. I think it was vital for the commission to hear that. Um, and to be forced to really respond and acknowledge uh, these other voices that unfortunately are often not heard. That's an important point as well. So, I mean, we don't have to have the entirety of this conversation tonight, but I would um, ask you to keep thinking on this point. Um, I, you know, don't, we don't have a immediate next step from the zoning commission. Nate, did they mention um, any, any timeline? Yes, they did. I believe the timeline was mid-January or it could have been mid-February. Let me just make sure in my notes. So they're going to respond to the case record by mid-December. And the goal is to, um, yes, should have it ready by early January, according to Commissioner Hood. But he reiterated several times um, to not hold them to that timeline. So I would expect um, February. That's what, probably why February was in my mind. Okay. And I'm putting in the chat now a link to um, to apply for the vacancy that's currently on the Zoning Commission. There is a vacancy. Obviously, um, these are mayoral appointees, so you your application would have to get <laughs> past the mayor. The mayor would have to accept it and, and send it to the council. However. I think it's really important that we, um, you know, start trying to identify people. I think we do have a line of communication open now with Anthony Hood, and he is looking for somebody to join the commission that also cares about racial equity, at least in terms of what he said to me about it. Um, so I would love to, you know, have a number of um, great people uh, submit your qualifications. Uh, you don't have to be a zoning expert to be on the zoning commission. I think you do have to be willing to put the time in to review the cases. It's helpful, of course, if you have a, um, some type of housing or development background. Um, but I think um, there's many of you who've been involved, you know, from a civic uh, perspective in zoning cases and in the comp plan. And I would I would encourage you to consider submitting your name, especially people who live at east of the river and women. There's currently no women on the commission and no people who live east of the river. So um, there's a couple people I'm going to be reaching out to <laughs> to see if I can encourage you. And then going back to the other qu question that Nate had posed, you know, there's discussion about who who should be doing the racial equity analysis. Right now, um, the Office of Planning has the zoning section that advises the zoning commission, and they do the analysis on uh, for the zoning commission of what's called comp plan consistency. And they would be wrapping this racial equity analysis into comp plan consistency. Um, but I think many of us agree that it, that's the those folks tend to not be racial equity experts and um, may not be really equipped to do that. Uh, in the uh, REACH Act that established the Mayor's Office on Racial Equity, it also established the Council Office on Racial Equity, which is the only um, agency now in this city that's somewhat independent it's an independent entity in the sense that they um, they work uh, they serve the council they support the council by doing racial equity analysis but they're not um you know at risk of uh they're not they can't be fired by the council they're not you know reporting to the council in that way and they have they have they feel that sense of independence and being able to put forth positions that may or may not be supported by the council members, especially the people proposing the legislation. And so we're trying to figure out, is there a parallel to that here? Is there a way to create some entity that has some sense of independence that can do the racial equity analysis uh, within zoning? There was some discussions last year with um, CORE, um, Brian McClure, when he was the head of it, and he was even embracing of the idea of expanding CORE's purpose to encompass that. Uh, that would probably be a little difficult to do just by virtue of the separation between the council and the zoning commission. 
Um, but anyway, we're we're throwing that out there uh, as well for bright ideas amongst you for you know who should be doing this and how can we make sure the people advising the zoning commission on racial equity are actually racial equity people and not just zoning attorneys. <laughs> no offense to zoning attorneys, we love them, but you know it's uh, this is a specialty, right? So we think there needs to be. Uh, people who have, you know, the and the the framework in their brains of, of the types of questions that need to be asked uh, for situations like this. So with that, um, I want to thank you all for coming out. Is there any quick announcements uh, that anybody wants to share or closing comments before we uh, release you for the night, Karen? Oh, thank you, Parisa. I I just wanted to say very quickly that you can register to um, testify at the Green New Deal hearing, even if you have no idea <laughs> yet what you plan to say. All it is is you're giving your name, um, I think you know your phone number, maybe your ward, a few other pieces of information, but you don't have to tell them, you don't have to know what you plan to say, because you can work that out on the weekend before before the hearing on Tuesday. So, I mean, um, my experience is a lot of people are frightened to um, contact the city and say, I want to testify because they can't figure out ahead of time what they plan to say. I'm just trying to say, don't be frightened. You don't have to know ahead of time. Uh, at, the, at the moment when you register, you want to know ahead of time, probably before you speak, yeah. but not before you register. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. Um, any other comments or announcements, if you want to raise your hand, I'm going to share one, which is that tomorrow is a day of action for DC Public Schools and the um, Washington Teachers Union who have been fighting for a new contract for three years. Um, so all you have to do, it's, it's citywide, there's going to be um, teachers walking out at 315 at the end of the school day, um, and community members joining them at schools across the district. My understanding is everywhere, um, but certainly in, in my neighborhood um, at Whittier Elementary School, there, this will be taking place, and they're also uh, fighting to get the building modernized. This is where my daughter goes to school. Um, so just consider looking up uh, the school nearest you and and trying to head over there at 315. I, my, I, I believe it's going to be district wide that there'll be um, a rally at, at, all, at most of the public schools. Uh, I saw something in the chat. OK, um, I will resend uh, all of the Green New Deal information. I'll send an email out with all of the links um, and a lot of the stuff was um, was put in the chat earlier, Ruby, but I'll make sure it goes out. Will? Yeah, um, to Karen's point, I just put in a link uh, for a meeting, another Zoom meeting on Monday night. It's specifically to like talk about testimony and there'll be people like writing and sharing sample testimonies. So it'll be a longer form sort of like real testimony prep um, for people that are interested in testifying. So. Um, you can sign up at that link if you really want to talk about what you want to say and, and ask, ask questions about that. So much, Will. He's been doing a lot of uh, info sessions, so I appreciate that. Um, and one last thing I'll mention before we go, since I don't see any other hands, is that, um, you know, the elections are over, so now there'll be the process of creating the new council committees. For, for the new year. Um, a number of us are very concerned that Anita Bonds not continue as chair of the housing committee. Um, we have stated that publicly before, but um, generally the, the work of identifying committee assignments is pretty internal to the council and the public doesn't really get to, you know, have much of a role in it. Um, however, a number of groups are going to be joining forces to put some pressure on Mendelssohn to not 
allow Anita to be the chair anymore. Uh, um, so if this is something that you're interested in, um, feel free to message me because we will be having a, we'll be organizing a meeting with some of the um, groups that are interested in this um, right after Thanksgiving. And um, there's other committees of interest too. Yes, Caroline. I, I'm very interested in that. I share your sentiments precisely. Um, but the question is who, who would yeah. you propose as an alternative? Do you, do you have a, something in mind? I think that's a conversation I'd like to have during the meeting with with multiple folks, you know, because I think all of us have had different experiences with different council members. Um, some people have some intel about who on the council might be angling for the committee. You know, I personally um, like the idea of Janice Lewis George, who is the, uh, you know, the, the sponsor of the social housing bill. Um, but I think that that's the conversation I definitely want to involve, you know, the larger group in thinking through. I think some folks were um, thinking that Alyssa Silverman would be the person, but, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So uh, any last? Um, yeah, so we will definitely reach out to uh, JUFJ was put in the chat and there's a number of um, there's a number of other aligned groups that have been, you know, speaking about this. Uh, Aziza says hi, and it's it's eight oh three, so we'll let everybody go. Feel free to uh, unmute and say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I brought show and tell for your daughter's school tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that's great, Nick. Yeah. There's a school right by us. If I can get yeah. out of my meeting in time, I'll just walk over. <laughs>